Hello, everyone. My name is Regan Papal. I will be the um, webinar instructor for today. Um, today, we are going to look at laser cutting here at DoSpace and a little bit about the two machines we've got here and how to prep for them because it's a little bit of a different process for both machines. I teach art and graphic design over at Iowa Western Community College, um, and I've been laser cutting for quite a while now. So let's go ahead and take a look. Now, as we are going through um, this stuff, feel free to post questions in the question and answer feature of Zoom, and then also feel free to use the chat, um, and I will answer questions as I can. There will be a, a little bit of time left over at the end of this webinar for if you need anything demoed or if you have any other kind of questions like uh, that. So let's take a look at this, uh, start taking a look. All right, so there's two machines. This is the older of the two here at um, Do Space. And so this is the uh, universal, not VLS, it's ULS, universal VLS laser. Um, and it's a 30 watt machine, which means it can cut a lot, but um, neither of these machines are going to be able to mark or cut metal. So don't, uh, don't try it. Um, it has a decent material size of 12 by 16 by four inches. That four inches is part of what makes it a little bit more interesting than the Glowforge. And it can also handle cylindrical objects. So it's got this thing that you can mount in it and you can make uh, engravings on like uh, glass, believe it or not, or certain types of coated plastics. Or um, if you've got like a metal that's coated in some sort of paint or whatever, you can burn off the paint and it's a quite a good um, appearance. This one is very good for users who are going to be a little bit more advanced or comfortable with kind of a um, uh, no frills, you need to know your settings uh, interface. Now the other machine they have is kind of like the Apple computer of, of uh, laser cutters. So they have what's called a Glowforge Pro. And when I say the Apple computers of laser cutters, I mean that both in the positive and the negative sense. It's really easy to use for a laser cutter. Um, but by having made it so easy to use, um, it can be very frustrating and not um, like, you know, a laser cutter should be able to do something, but this machine won't do it because it's trying to be too user friendly. Um, it's a little bit more powerful. So if you've got stuff where you're going to be doing a bunch of cutting rather than just marking or in great uh, scoring, um, this one can do it usually a little bit faster because it's got a little bit more power through it. It still can't mark metal, so don't try it. Um, material size is pretty robust at 11 by 19 and a half, and it can take stuff that's two inches, oops, two inches deep. Um, just keep in mind that when it says two inches deep, that if you put something in there uh, thicker than like a regular laptop computer, you'll need to take out the crumb tray and do a little bit of finagling. So if, um, if you bring in something, you know, really any thicker than like an inch, uh, make sure you touch base with the people at the help desk uh, to get it set up correctly. Um, can't do cylindrical objects in this one though, because it doesn't have a cylindrical hookup. All right, so Glowforge and the ULS, the laser cutter speaks two different languages. So this is a picture of J. Jonah Jameson that's been made both as what's called a raster image, an image made up of individual pixels and then also as a uh, vector image, which is an image made up of points and lines. So when you feed these two kind of files into a laser cutter, it's going to do two very different things. Um, the file on the left, it's going to try to use a half tone. It's going to make a bunch of tiny little dots um, with the laser to um, kind of try to create the appearance of the image in black and white through what's called like a half tone. Like if you read manga, uh, and you see like all that kind of dot pattern that they use for some of those black and white manga. It's the same idea, just at a much finer scale. Now it's not gonna be fine enough that you won't be able to see it, but it's still pretty good. Um, on the other hand, there's lines that are inside here and we'll take a look at them when we get into Illustrator. And what you can have those lines do is um, the laser will instead follow those lines, which is really good for cutting out shapes or making very clean uh, smooth uh, marks on the machine rather than using this dot pattern. Um, so there's two different kinds of color spaces when you work in um, vector editing programs. So that would be like Inkscape and uh, Adobe Illustrator and we'll be looking at Illustrator. And Illustrator likes to default into CMYK, which is a mass market um, or a mass production uh, color print profile. 
Uh, it's also what you would use if you're going to be doing like um, screen printing. So if you're separate, if you're doing your separate screens and you're done screen printing, that's all in CMYK. Laser cutters speak RGB. So when we're setting up our um, file, we'll want to make sure that we take a look at RGB. And this, this slide right here is really kind of like as a uh, reference for you. So when we um, also set up our um, colors in our color picker, these are the colors that you're going to want to use, which is pure uh, black, pure red, pure green, and pure blue in RGB. Again, you can see the CMYK values it gives us are fairly different um, than what you would assume. All right, there's um, a couple different things that you can do using the laser cutter. So we have laser cut, laser etch, laser score, and then we're also going to have engrave, which isn't on this demo picture right here. So a vector score is this bottom one that we see right here. So it's going to create a line um, on the on whatever you've put on here, and it's going to follow the path that we've set up in Illustrator. It makes, again, really for good, clean uh, lines. Something that a lot of people will do is that they'll do something like a laser etch right here for fonts or lettering, and then go around it with the laser score to clean up the edges. That's a really good um, trick. And the key difference here between score and cut is obviously it doesn't cut through. You'll want to put all of your score stuff into a separate layer, and you want to make sure that it's all 0 0.01 uh, green stroke no fill. Again, more about what this means later. This is a reference slide for later when um, you can look this video up on YouTube or do spaces Facebook and just open it up and be like, oh yeah, that's the setting I needed. Um, we have laser cut. We're going to put these ones at 0 0.01 and red, and it does exactly what it sounds like. It cuts uh, through rather than just mark. And then we have raster etch. So this is where you would upload either a picture or you would have a filled shape in Illustrator. And what it's going to do is it's going to make a half tone. And based on how black something is, it will put more marks closer together on whatever you're blasting. So let's say that you were doing a photograph, depending on if you're going to put it on black or white materials, like black plexiglass versus white plexiglass, you might actually need to invert your image for it to come out right. So what I would say is that you will want to always um, test this before running it through on something big. Do a couple of tests to find out how dark or how bright you need to make the image and then whether or not you want it positive or negative. And we'll look at flipping those colors um, in a minute. Um, so again, black, full power, white, no power, and then everything grayscale in between. Now, when you rasterize this, the key number that we're going to talk about in rasterizing is 300. And that's about that's better than what the laser cutter can actually do. But this is what you would do like formal printing at. Um, so this will look as about as good as you're going to get it in terms of pixel density in your raster image. Otherwise, you can end up having like the appearance of pixels even in your etch, which doesn't look so great. The last one that we can look at is raster engrave. So it's that same idea as this raster etch, but instead of creating a dot pattern, it's going to go much more slowly and it's going to cut into the material, incise into the material based on white through black. So at black, it's going to go as far as it can go into the material, and then you can control that it doesn't go through the material based on the speed. There's presets for this, so you won't be completely lost if you go for it. Um, up through white, where it won't make any sort of engraving whatsoever. So you can see here, and you can even see the, the line direction that it was making as it did this, where it engraved in deeply to create, create a three-dimensional shape. Now, photographs don't look good on this because photographs aren't the white through black isn't actually 3D data. So like it's really easy to convert 3D data into what's called a depth map. This is a little bit more advanced. You're welcome to look up how to generate depth maps. It's like a whole we could spend the whole webinar talking about it. You can also set up varying shapes and other things into um, different grayscales or darknesses if you really want to kind of incise deeper into it to kind of create a nice effect. So like I will sometimes do multiple text things on a single uh, a single object that I'm making and I'll I'll set it to like raster and grave and put some of that text really deep in there and some of it up closer to the surface and it's a really good visual effect. Just like our raster etch layer, it should be at 300 ppi. 
um, just kind of an example of what these files look like. So vector score, vector cut, um, raster etch. You can see that this picture has been inverted, so it will look correct when it comes out. And then raster engrave. So like here's like this part of the text would be very close to the surface. This would be very far in. And this praying mantis has been depth mapped in a way that it'll actually appear as a three-dimensional uh, object as we go, as we pull it out of the machine. Some more examples of what people like to do. So this is a nice little, that looks like just an etch where they've kind of marked the surface. Here's one where they've gone through and created very intricate cuts. And something that when you look at these, this looks like a lot of work, but if you think about it, all you really need to do is make this one little slice. It's like just that little slice right there. And then you can copy and paste it all the way around. So these kind of repeating shape ones are actually pretty easy to make. And then here's a really good example of raster etch where they've done that half tone pattern to create the appearance of an image. And then my guess, this is a little re low resolution to tell, but my guess would be as they went through and they did a vector score around a lot of these shapes and text to make it a little bit easier um, to see and understand um, once it was done. Something else you can do is you can create three dimensional shapes. Um, so there's a couple of website builders like Ian Maker Case. Um, so if you type in laser cutter box plans, it'll come up. There's a lot of these things on Thingiverse that you can make. Um, and it's a way of generating a 3D object out using the laser cutter, which is fun and popular to do. So you can see like even on this one, they've added like an edge and on this one, they've added a nice cut through and a nice cut through on this one. So like Ian Maker case, um, the only thing you have to really be careful of is to make sure that your material thickness is correct. So like right now you can see that it's one eighth of an inch, but one eighth of an inch is actually 0.125 rather than 0.18. Um, so that's like the actual thickness of one eighth acrylic isn't actually one eighth. So you'll wanna make sure you measure um, the material before you um, actually set it through in here because that's gonna affect, it's so like when we do our, oops, that's not actually the thing. If we did our fingers right here, which are, these guys right here, it has to be the right thickness. Um, some other good examples. So you can do, there's um, from Fusion 360, there's their 3D uh, slicer where it can base it up out of these layers. So you can run that through, you can run 3D print, 3D printable objects through um, these special kind of slicing programs that will split these up into different um, sheets that you can cut out and glue out to make these awesome 3D puzzles. And then here's a good example of a puzzle um, you don't necessarily even have to do an etch on here. You could um, paste a photograph onto this and then cut it out using the laser cutter. That, that's a really good, nice little gift um, if you're looking for a fun project on a laser cutter. Um, some more advanced stuff. So this is what like fine artists would be making. So this is Gabrielle Shama. And you can see where she's done multiple layers to create these kind of intricate and very beautiful designs in wood with a laser cutter. And so like this could be done with some effort in uh, Illustrator, but you know, really excellent use of layering and design in this. Um, locally, there's an artist named Jave Yoshitomo. He has a show up over at Pace Gallery in Council Bluffs. So um, if you want, you can actually go see a bunch more of these and they're really good. So I would say, go take a look at these things. Um, over in Council Bluffs, you just have to schedule ahead to go see it good show but same idea where he's using uh, multiple layers of wood to create a very three-dimensional object and then he's adding more to it by using this raster engraved to create details on there that would otherwise be missing so very good use of this and then personally i do things like this where i do um, three-dimensional engraves to kind of make these ball reliefs for these mantises um, which i then sometimes turn around and put on to this kind of tomb thing i've got going right here which just like what I was talking about with these, this is just a uh, 3D object that I ran through a slicer and then I've glued all these parts together to kind of create this awesome building shape. So you can do a lot of really cool things um, with this laser cutter and the concept and controls to do it are surprisingly uh, simple. So let's go ahead and take a look at some example files and then talk about creating these things um, ourselves. And I don't need to save that edit. All right, let me check my notes, make sure I'm not skipping anything. Blah, 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 blah. All right, let's open up Illustrator. All right, so here, uh, we don't need this one open anymore. No. Here's our demo sheet, our laser cut head and our relief. 
So to make something like this uh, mantis root, I'm going to switch to the camera real quick so we can see the actual one that I brought in. Stop share. And so you can see um, here's the actual thing, um, and it's actually two layers. So like when we when I cut this out, I cut a separate top layer that I then placed over my other layer to create my design to give it more depth. Not that there isn't a lot of depth to the actual shape, but it's a fun, interesting way of creating additional depth. Now you don't necessarily have to do something as fancy as that. So again, like we've got right here, which is our raster and grave, which is how I made the mantis. And then there's these cuts that go around it for the rest of it. You can be a lot more simple and do something like this woman's head, um, let me uh, right here. And you can see, um, there we go. It's hard to see. So you can see that this is just cut paper and it goes really quick and easy. And making something like this is surprisingly not hard. So like white paper, black paper. And when we look at that in Illustrator, share, you can see that the actual file looks pretty simple. Um, similarly, you can also make one of those. Um, oh, I'm, see, I've got the wrong window active. There we go. Similarly, you can also make those boxes. So back out of share mode, you can make a little box like this very simply with that Ian Baker case. I use it to hold my thumbtacks, which is fun. Okay, so let's take a look at how we actually make these files though. A little clunky jumping between Zoom and not Zoom share and not Zoom share. So this is all just those cut lines. Um, and this is that fancy one. So let's actually look at how we'd go about creating this. So if you're on your home screen, which is like what you first get when you open up Illustrator, you can come over and click on create new, or you can always come up to file and go to new to start a new document. Um, then you can just pick any of these to get started. Why don't we pick one for print and just pick letter for now. And that will be our start. Over here on the right, we've got a bunch of settings that are going to matter that we want to set now. So we can change our name of it. So I'm going to go ahead and label this one laser cutter demo. And then notice that it's in points and like points is in like font size. And it's like, that's not super useful to most people that aren't hardcore into typography. So let's go ahead and switch this to inches and that drop down. So it makes a little bit more sense. Um, let's go ahead and make this so it would actually fit in either the universal or the Glowforge. So remember our universal one is uh, 12 by 16, um, while the uh, Glowforge is 11 by uh, 19 and a half. So I need to make it you know, a little bit smaller. So 11 by 16 would be the max size that I could fit between both of them. Um, so just keep that in the back of your head. So like one is 11, the other one's 19 and a half. It's a little goofy. The rest of this stuff we don't care about except down here in advanced options. So I'm going to click on advanced options to open this up. And I'm going to make sure my raster effects are set to 300. And I'm going to switch my color mode to be RGB color. So this is what I need for my laser cutter. And I can click create to get my baseline document. Now, when you first open up Illustrator, for whatever reason, Adobe wants to make this program easier to use. But by making it easier to use, they've made it way less useful. So like. They got rid of a bunch of interface by trying to make it useful, more easy to use, which makes it harder to use. So the first thing you're going to do when you open up Illustrator is fix Adobe being stupid. And that's where you click Essentials. And you'll go to Essentials Classic, giving you your options bar back, which is really just really a useful thing. The other thing I like to have up is I like to have rulers going around the outside of my screen to make it easier to keep track of where everything is. So if I go up to View and I go to Rulers, show or I hit control R on my keyboard, it will reappear these rulers. This is also nice because this allows you to switch between different um, units of measurement if you need to. So you can always drop into millimeters or if you accidentally were still in pecos or points or whatever, you can come back to inches just by right clicking on that ruler and switching back. Um, similarly, if you forgot to change your color space, you can always come up to what is it file document color mode and pick RGB right here as well to get you back into what you need to be just in case you accidentally put yourself in CMYK. Lastly, if you accidentally put yourself in um, raster uh, at the wrong raster settings, if you come over to effect and go to document raster effects, 
you can come over and pick 300. And then I found that transparent works pretty well for me. I generally don't have white on and I'll click OK. So now we're ready to start making um, our stuff. So our tool paths are the paths that we can create in Illustrator. So, you know, like I have the line tool right here. And if I click um, and drag, I can make a line. So click and drag and I've got my line. Now this line right now, if I click away from it, becomes invisible because it doesn't have anything assigned to its attributes. So I'm gonna go ahead and reselect it. And I'm selecting this, by the way, using the selection tools. This selection tool allows me to select whole lines or shapes. Um, so it needs to have um, a weight to it or what we call a stroke. So right up here in the top where of this options bar, notice we've got this box of the line through it. This is our fill. The one next to it is our stroke. So I'm going to go ahead and pick black out of here, and you can see that it defaults to a point to a one point stroke. And this will be fine for now. I can always come back and change this to something else. I can always change this color to something else. I would start with something that's easy to see so you can manipulate and get your shape um, where you want it. And then you can come back and do your color formatting. So if this line tool allows me to draw lines and this selection tool allows me to select and move around whole shapes. I also have the direct select tool, which is this filled in arrow that allows me to interact with parts of a shape. So this shape is a point and a point with a line on it. So I can select individual points and then just move that one point rather than move um, the whole line. Then I can always delete one point at a time uh, using the delete key with the direct select active. I can also draw full shapes using the rectangle tool. So full shape. Um, if I wanted to do that raster engrave or raster etch thing of this, this is where I could come through and you know pick different grays or blacks to have that put in there. Generally, you don't have anything in there whatsoever because you're just using this as a tool path to make a cut or a score line. Looks pretty cool, right? Now, if I wanted to, I can change the shape of this by switching to the direct select tool and I can pick up individual points and start moving them around to create a more you know, interesting shape. Um, if we click into the square tool, we can see that there's a bunch of other options in here to create out different shapes that we can do whatever we want with. Now, if we wanted to merge what we've got together right here, we'll want to use the shape builder tool. So I'm going to pick up my selection tool and I'm going to select all three of these, which I can do just by clicking and dragging around all three. Or if I pick up, click on one of the lines and then hold down the shift key and click on the other lines, I can have a little bit more control over what's being selected. Now, if I wanted to turn this into a single shape, I'll pick up the shape builder tool right here. And what this allows me to do is to click and drag across uh, closed shapes to put them together. Now, let's say I didn't want to merge them. Let's say I just wanted to like merge this two together. So I've got that. Let's say that I actually wanted to cut this circle out of it. If I hold down the Alt key, and when I hold down the Alt key, you'll notice that the symbol next to my cursor switches to a minus. That means anything I click and drag over gets removed. So a really easy way to make quick, interesting shapes. Now, not everything is going to be geometric shapes. Sometimes I want to be able to draw um, something. So I have the manual mode of drawing, which is this pen tool. What this pen tool allows me to do is to click and drop a point, and then I can click and drop another point. I can click and drop another point, and I can start drawing all these lines. Now, if I click and drag, I'll start curving these lines as I go. Um, the other thing that this will allow me to do, so let's try something a little bit more simple than that, a little bit simpler. So click, click, click. Click. Notice how when I come to this last one, I get a little circle next to my cursor. This means that this is a closed shape. So if I overlapped the shape tool over this, I'd be able to use the shape builder tool with it. If I didn't get that little mark right there, then this isn't closed and that shape builder tool wouldn't work. So a little bit something that can be irritating. Now I could always come back through with the direct select tool and click on individual points and you know move them around. But what if I wanted to curve this line? Notice how when I mouse over it now, because I made it with this pen tool, I get a little curve on my mouse cursor telling me I can start curving it. Similarly, if I click and hold on the pen tool, I get the anchor point tool. This allows me to click on an anchor point and drag out to give it a curve or to click on a line and curve it as well. Notice whenever I click on one of these lines or points, I get these little handle dudes. 
These handle dudes are my Benzier curve controls, and they're how I can really powerfully create custom shapes in Illustrator. So like in the other workshop demo I do for Illustrator, we use this to outline a hand pretty quickly and impressively um, for our use. Um, now, sometimes you do just want freehand control of this. So what tool do we use for that? So let's go ahead and delete this line out. And delete, delete. That would be the brush tool. Now, the brush tool is going to assume you want a stroke on it. So when I click and drag, it will make these little line dudes. Now, the problem with it is, is if I try to draw a closed shape, so like, like that. Oops, not quite. Let's do a little bit nicer one. So that looks like a closed shape, right? If we actually look at it, so let's click the selection tool and make it active. It's still, there's a little gap right there. If we zoom in, I'm going to hit Z for zoom, and then I'm going to click and drag on here so I have the magnifying glass tool. You can see that these two points are, are not actually connected. So that's one of the difficult, irritating things of the brush tool is it looks like you've made a closed shape, but you haven't. So how do we close this? If you pick up the direct select tool, and you click and drag over the two points that need to be joined. You can go up to object, uh, path, and then join or control J to join that so it now becomes a shape. So like, I could also do that right here to join those two. So let me see control J. You can see how it added a line between it. And then up here as well, I can select those and command J it so I can form a shape. So if I hadn't formed that shape and I tried, you know, take a circle out of this, it, I can't like the, shape builder tool won't work with well it works there but it won't do anything up here like it's just cutting that out of the circle it's not cutting anything out of this shape but now like if i did it down here it will fully interact with both of those so here let me back up a little bit so i can really demo that it's like if i'm trying to you know add this to this like it just doesn't i get something separate from it like it's not actually part of that. All I've done is kind of messed with this circle versus like if I bring it over here to this closed shape, I can actually join it to that using the shape builder tool. Oops, I got to select it first. Boink. You can see that it becomes one thing. So rather than using this as a cutout for that circle, this can then join that circle. So make sure you join your points if that's something you want to be able to do. All right, so let's go ahead and set up three circles right here. One, two, three, uh, four. And let's give let's give two of these circles a fill. So I'm going to come back to my select tool, and why don't we give you a middle gray fill, and why don't we give you you know a darker gray fill? Oops, I entered isolation mode. Back out of isolation mode. All right, so if I was going to start formatting these for laser cutting, I need to do, uh, I need to set them up. So this first one, let's set up as our cut. So I'm gonna make it active. I'm gonna come up to here for my outline and I want to set my outliner stroke to be red. And so notice how this is actually CMYK red, so that's not gonna work. If I mouse down here, that's also CMYK red. So how do I get, where is RGB red? Is that RGB red? Nope, that's still in CMYK. So how do I make this, red. I'm going to double click and this is irritating guys. I'm sorry. I can double click on my little outline down here and you can see that I can type in those RGB numbers or I can also come up to color. And I'll need to click this window right here and do show options and it will also give me RGB sliders for this. So if I was going to make this cut, it needs to be pure red. So I will zero out the green. I will zero out the blue. And I will max out the red and max is 255. That little warning thing right here means it's not a printable color. We're going to be printing this like on a document printer or fine art printer, but it's a color that laser cutter speaks. So this is now good for, oops, we need to make it thinner first, uh, 0 0.01. This is now good for cut. Yay. Now this one, let's set up as a score. So depending on the machine, because it, it varies from machine to machine, this will either be blue or green. So I'll zero out red and I will set, we'll set green to 255 in this case, and we'll set blue to zero. 
This could also be a nice way to set up multiple strengths of scoring. So let's say you wanted to have some of these lines cut very thick and some of them cut very, I mean, very deep and some of them cut very shallow. You could set up green at one power setting and blue at another. More on that in a minute. And again, I'm gonna set this to point zero one. Now, what about our raster stuff? So let's say I wanted to print this as that half tone, or it'll make a bunch of little dots on my um, thing to kind of create that illusion of tone. So I need to rasterize this shape because right now, if the laser cutter won't know what to do with it, I need to turn it into a raster. So I'm going to come up to what is it, object, and go to rasterize. In rasterize, I want to make sure RGB, RGB mode is still set. Uh, right here. I still want it at 300. I like to do transparent. Um, and then since we're doing art, we're not doing tight, you want to make sure art optimized is picked and you just click OK. And just like magic, it's ready to go. And you'll do exactly the same thing here for that raster engraved, believe it or not. You'll treat these um, the same. So we'll come up to object and we'll go to rasterize and we'll set it at the same thing. So now these four objects speak laser cutter. So this speaks cut, this one speaks uh, score, this one speaks um, either raster etch or engraved, depending on we set it. And same thing with this one right here. This one also speaks raster engraved or whatever. Now, what about text? So text gets a little bit different. So let's go ahead and grab our T for text tool. And just like in any text editing program, you've got some character controls. I like to go up to window and go to type and open up character to get a little bit stronger of a window, although there's still stuff missing from it. So we have to click our little options guy right here and do show options. Again, that's just these little lines right here. Again, it's just Adobe trying to simplify things for some reason, so they hide stuff and it's just like, why do you do this? Um, let's pick the font that makes typographers angry. So let's do impact. And the reason I'm doing impact is because it's big and easy to see. And I'll just click right here and I will type in text um, just so we can see what's going on. And let's make this nice and big. All right, so right now, this doesn't speak laser cutter. I need to turn it into something uh, that does. So if I wanted to do it as a score or a cut, I need to convert it into a path. If I wanted to do it as an engrave or a etch, I mean, an edge or an engrave, I need to convert it to a raster. So let's actually make two of these. So if I've got one text thing and I want to duplicate it, if I hold down the Alt key or the Option key if I'm on an Apple computer and drag over, I can quickly duplicate objects, which is really neat. Um, although as a fair warning, by the way, if you overlap stuff like this, it will still do this full shape. Like even though it doesn't look like the full shape is there, It'll do this full shape and the text thing separately. So make sure we, if you overlap stuff that you cut it out around it. Otherwise, you end up with it looking a little goofy. All right, so let's set this one up as a cut or a score. So to turn this text to speak laser cutter, cut and score, I will go up to object and I'm going to go to what is it? Or no, excuse me, I want to go to type and I want to go to create outlines. And then we go to our layers, we can see that it'll be speaking out. I will just skip the layers thing. If you wanted to, you can come over to layers and we can dig into here and we can see that each letter is its own thing. Um, in our case, all we need to do is with this text thing still active, we'll turn off the fill and we'll add our red stroke. So where's my colors? Oops, uh, color and I want strokes. I'm gonna click on this box to make it active. I will type in 255 in my red, and we'll go ahead and add point, oops, not what I wanted to do. And I'll put in point zero 0.01 for my stroke. So now this would cut out. And, you know, I could switch to green if I wanted to. Yay. Now, if I wanted to turn this into something that speaks etch or engrave, I need to rasterize this text. And this is going to be a little bit different than rasterizing these. So if I come up to object and I go to rasterize, the thing that I want to make sure that I pick is I don't want art optimized in this case. I want type optimized for the hinting. Hinting is a thing where typographers will add certain information into this, especially at smaller sizes, that will help make this text look correct um, 
by from converting it from you know because it's secretly these lines by the way um, from when converting it to these shapes into pixels it will look for areas where stuff overlaps weirdly and make sure it comes out right so type optimize when you rasterize can make text come out especially small text significantly better and i'll go ahead and click ok and now this guy speaks um, laser cutter as well all right so how do we actually send these over to the laser cutter Let me make sure i'm not skipping anything turning text to the toolpath. we talked about brushes we talked about pen and shape tool all right, so let's talk about sending this out to our cutters. So if you're going to be doing this guy, the ULS, the what the ULS laser, it's a little goofy. We're going to come up to file and we're going to go to print, right? Print. And we're going to make sure printer VLS 2.30 is selected. And then we're going to click on setup. And I'm going to click don't show again and click continue because I'm tired of that thing. And I can click on preferences and it will open up um, the controls for the laser cutter so I can tell it certain things. So if I come into here and I go to manual control, we can see there's actually a bunch of different colors in here and I can set the control for each color to do something else. Um, so it's a really powerful way to make sure everything is speaking, um, speaking the correct colors. Like in here, we can see that we've got the power at 50%. I can type in stuff. Similarly, I can come over to the materials database and make sure that I pick um, a material that it can cut. So let's pick, you know, cherry or something. And it will use those colors to spit out um, what I'm doing. Now, something that's going to be important is that we need to put in our material thickness. So like we have a pair of calipers. Let me switch off screen share so you can see them. Calipers. And it's pretty straightforward. You turn it on, it slides up and down, and you measure the thickness of your material. And you'll use those to um, check the thickness of whatever you're running through the machine. So you can type it in right here. So let's say our material was half an inch, which would be 0.5. Um, so that's telling it um, how thick it is, so it knows how much energy it has to use to cut through, you know, our cherry wood, which <laughs> honestly, this machine wouldn't cut through half an inch of cherry, to be blunt. It could cut through an eighth of an inch. Um, if you're okay with nasty edges, you can just run it through a couple of times. They get a little grumpy about that. Or um, you could also like turn up the, the power up here as well. So like, let's say I really wanted to make sure, um, if I really wanted to start cutting into it, I'd be like maximum vector cut power. Some other things I want to keep track of is like, I can change the direction that it's cutting. This can be nice if you haven't taped off your material um, to keep the smoke on there. And then if you're doing that rotary thing, um, you can pick rotary. Otherwise, um, you'll leave that alone. You can also turn up how good of a job it will spend doing um, the vectors. And then you can also be like, I want, um, I want more than this. So if I want more than this, this is where you'll come to manual control and you'll start telling it what you want each one of these colors to do. That said, start with the material database and then come over to manual control because it'll have loaded things in for you and you can go through and start changing so like let's say we wanted to make sure we wanted to change our way our raster was done we could do error diffusion or black and white error diffusion can look pretty good um, versus half tone this is something you'd want to experiment with to see which way you'd like it um, i would leave image enha enhancement off and then you can also be like do you want a higher quality image or do you want it deeper so it's a nice little slider versus how deep do you want it versus how good do you want the image to appear. Same thing with vector. We've got that same idea. Um, we can slide it between how deep do you want it and the quality of the image. And then we also have engraving where we can tell it to go in um, quite far, which actually we don't want engraving field. We want raster, normal, 3D. And this is how we can tell it to do that 3D engraving um, to do those kind of reliefs in our uh, in our image. So then you'll click OK, you'll click Print, and you'll click Print, and it will spit it out into the laser cutter right here for us to go through. Now, the first time you run this machine, schedule time with a mentor, and they will run you through the particulars of this machine and setting up the focus and all that. That's something I can't get into without having somebody sitting here next to me. But long short, um, we would turn the machine on, we would uh, we would focus it, and then we could start this bad boy up, and it would cut, it would do our design for us, and you know it would, it would do this, not nothing fancy. 
All right, so let's close this and take a look about how we would get this out of Illustrator and into uh, Glowforge. So Glowforge speaks a file format called SVG. So how do we get to SVG? We'll go up to File and we'll go to Save As and we'll pick SVG. And let's go ahead and just throw this on the desktop so it's easy to find. And when I do this save as, the thing that you 100% have to do, have to do, if you have images or any raster effects in here, is it's going to ask you where you want the image location. We need it to be in bed. If you pick anything else, like sometimes this defaults to link, your image won't be in the file and it won't work. You have to have it be embedded. Have to. And then we'll click OK. And it's that easy. Now it's ready for the Glowforge. Um, the first time you use this Glowforge, by the way, again, you'll want to schedule some time with somebody um, to show you like the actual machine and they'll set up an account for you to be able to access this. So you can um, connect to the machine because this is all done wirelessly through the internet for some reason. It's like one of the things that they've done to make it idiot proof. That's kind of irritating. You'll click create and you'll click upload from file. So let's navigate to my desktop. We have that laser cutter file demo and we'll click open. It will think about its life for a minute. So it's processing our image. If you've uploaded something very fancy, which I upload things that are pretty fancy to this, it can take a very long time. Now, one of the things that's nice about this machine is if you don't want to have to worry or have any guesswork about the settings that you're putting into here, Glowforge sells what's called proof grade materials and they come with a nice paper coating on them. And with that, what's nice about that paper coating is like when I mark this and then I pull off the paper, all the horrible residue will come with that paper. Or let's say that I want to paint this. If I leave that paper on there, I can spray paint this or stain it or whatever. And the paper will repel the paint or stain and then I can peel it off and anywhere where I cut in will be marked, which is really cool. Uh, but you can buy this material and it will automatically come over here to where it says unknown and it will automatically pick whatever that material is for you. It will know how thick it is and it will have all the settings for you. Material is a little bit more expensive. It's also cut to the correct size. But if you want to just have it be idiot proof, you can buy the stuff from uh, Glowforge right here in the shop. Otherwise, you have to pick it out. So like I usually work in acrylic. This is some light wood. They didn't tell me what it is. It's probably we'll just pick medium aspen. And you can see that it refocused it for us. Now it has guessed based on the colors that we put in here what each one of these should be. And it, it's guessing is, you know, sometimes off. So here is our metal middle shape, our uh, engrave. So this one. And when I click on it over here, I can also change the name of it if I want to. Um, but anyway, we'll open this up and I can pick a um, preset for this for it to be what I want. So like this is not a photo. So I gotta just be like HD graphic, please. And it will change um, the interior settings in here about how much power it's using, how quickly it's going, and what kind of dots it is. So I guys come in here and be like, I want it as a pattern rather than that, or I can do it by very power. Um, usually convert to dots will be what you want. And then lines per inch, 450 is a pretty good number. Um, you can take it further up than that. Depending on the material, it actually won't have any effect. Um, but 450 is a pretty good LPI, lines per inch. Um, for most of these machines. Um, but if you can, if you have a material that can really take fine detail, you can go ahead and crank this up. Just know that every time you crank it up, it's going to take much, much longer. Um, so let's go ahead and just say this was our graphic. So we'll just do HD graphic, or I can, if I just want this to go quickly, I can do draft graphic. Um, we'll pick up the next one. This one I wanted as that engraved, so it incises deeply into the surface. So I'll pick uh, 3D engrave. Uh, and again, engrave will give us the same setup over here. Very powerful power. If I want it to go um, deeper, I would just slow this down. Um, just know that the slower you go, the more likely you are to uh, light it on fire. And that's not as big of a deal as it sounds like, but still don't light this stuff on fire. That's something it'll go over when you first sit down on this machine. Um, text, we wanted this one also as an engrave. And why don't we do as HD graphic again? This one was not cut. So this is where we want score. And we can do a high quality score or a draft score. 
And then this one has set up as a cut. And I can also come through and you know move individual shapes in here. Um, but I'll be like, why don't we make you a cut, proof grade cut, we're good to go. The last step is to, oops, my little Zoom interface is covering, to click this print button. And this is one of the areas that's a little frustrating about Glowforge is if you've loaded up a very complicated design, this calculation can take a while. So like I'm laser engraving thousands of letters into a single sheet of acrylic. And, you know, I push that button and I sit here for like five to 10 minutes as it thinks about its life. And then it's like a four hour cut. I mean, four hour score on my acrylic. And it's just like, thanks, Glowforge. I wish this was faster. Um, so while it thinks about its life, it's going to do a lot of the stuff automatically for you that you have to do on the uh, universal laser, such as it's automatically focusing for you, it's automatically centering everything, it should be WYSIWYG on here, you don't have that WYSIWYGness on the other machine. And you can see on the settings that we've picked right now that this would be an hour and 12 minutes. So this is where you giggle and you come over here and you, you know, you turn down uh, your graphic settings because this is going to take way too long. So why don't we actually set you to draft graphic and uh, why don't we set you to draft graphic as well? We'll click cancel. And you can see just by changing those settings, this will take way less time because what it'll do is it will use less lines to make those marks. This one will still take a while because it was at like 300 something. This one's will have dropped it down quite a bit. So the lines will be more apparent, but you won't be sitting here for an hour and 12 minutes waiting for it to do its thing. Um, Come on, little glow forward, you can do it. Like, I wish they didn't do this in the cloud. That's part of what takes it so long. Yeah, so you can see that it's taking less than half the time that it had before. Now, if your material was actually over here and not where this little square marker is, you can click to tell it to set the focus somewhere else. Uh, it's not gonna let me because I already started this, but you can click on set focus and then click on a spot. Be like, actually focus there, please. Uh, let me check my notes to make sure we aren't missing anything or otherwise we might be in demo time. All right. A couple last things before we get to demo time. Um, look up the material that you want to cut and make sure you can cut it. So like certain types of paints, anything that has lead in it, don't run it through the cutter. So like if you painted something with lead, no. If you painted, um, if you've got vinyl, also no. There's a vinyl cutter here, you wanna use that guy, it uses a razor blade. When you burn vinyl, it creates chlorine gas. Um, here at Do Space is actually a binder that has everything in it that you can cut and some suggested settings for the universal laser. But please Google your materials to make sure that you can cut it. Stuff that's safe to run through this is paper. I run paper through mine all the time. You can run leather through it. Don't run pleather through it, um, leather. Um, you can run just about any kind of wood on it, depending on what it's coated in. So if it's just naked wood, cool, run it through there. Um, or you can tape it off. Blue Painter's Tape is a beautiful material to coat your stuff in um, if you want to do that cutout effect. Um, acrylic and plexiglass are both safe to run through this. There's one type that runs a little bit better through there. Um, you can buy this stuff from Menards, or if you're going to need a lot of it, there's a company here in town, or in Papillion, called Midwest Plastics. They get people from Do Space all the time. They've got fabulous prices on their acrylic. Buy it from them and you won't be sorry. Although if you only need like one or two pieces, go pick it up from um, Menards. Um, you want the stuff that's hard, that um, is less bendy. Um, the stuff that's more rigid will run through the machine a little bit better when you're at Menards or Lowe's. So if you bend it and it's really easy to bend, get the other stuff. Um, don't run Lexan through the cutter. It will be labeled Lexan. It will also produce a hideously poisonous gas that can kill you. Whew. Okay, right? All right, so this is your guys' chance. Um, if you have any questions, please post them in question and answer or in the chat. If we don't get anything, I will demo some more um, shape building stuff in the minutes that we have uh, left. So again, if you need to see some, how something works on this, this is your chance to ask. While you guys are typing, I have some more little examples here in my pocket. 
Let's stop the share. It's like I've got a little, so like a PTK over at Iowa Western has me make these nice little shapes for them. So this one still has the paper on it. So what we're going to do is we're going to paint in this lighter blue with gold. And then when we peel off this paper, that will be the nice shiny blue. I peeled some of it off on this side already, though. Or like, a, here's another one for like PTK Trivia Night, although we didn't, I haven't uh, done it. And then this is like just a demo I made for um, the other teacher that does laser cutting so you can have it um, for fun. These things are great and easy, by the way. They, we do these as exercises in some of my graphic design classes. And also in one of my art classes, we do the paper cuts because it's a great way to learn um, this tool and it's fun. All right, looks like we don't have any questions. So let's take a look at um, converting images. So let's just find, you know, a happy face here in Google. Happy images. All right, obviously this would be copyright violation, but whatever, this will work for today. So we'll go to desktop and save this bad boy. Come to Illustrator. So let's look at how we can drop our image in and convert it into something that speaks uh, laser cutter. So I'm going to come over here and I'll go to file and I am going to go to place. And when I do this place, I want to make sure um, that link right here is turned off because if link, oops, see when I clicked on it, it switched to link. I want to turn that off because this will then mean the image is embedded in here and it will save me lots and lots of headache. And then we'll click and drag and here is happy. So this right now doesn't speak laser cutter. It would have to convert itself to black and white and it'll get grumpy and things like that. If I want to control that process. I'm going to come up to edit. Uh, where is it? Edit colors. And I want to do convert to grayscale. And then if I wanted this to come out a little bit better, depending on what material I'm putting it into, because again, anywhere that's black on here it will engrave in. Anywhere it's white, it won't. So if I was putting this into shiny black acrylic, anywhere it engraves is actually going to be lighter. So I would want to invert this image. So I'm going to come up to edit and I will go to edit colors and I will do invert colors. And now I've got my inverted grayscale. Now, when I spit this guy out, I want to make sure that it's um, set correctly. So I can always come up to effect and check my document raster effects to make sure it's going to come out at 300 PPI. Now there's one big caveat with this. If this image isn't high enough resolution when I drop it in, it's so like this wasn't very high resolution. If I blew this thing up huge, um, these pixels are gonna show up no matter what. So make sure when you drop in, high, drop in images, they're high enough resolution that when it converts to 300 uh, PPI, when you, ex when you export the SVG or hit the print button, you can't see these already because otherwise it will be a bad time and there's nothing you can do about it. Something else that's neat that you can do with images, so let's shrink this guy down a little bit, is let's say I wanted this image to be just, um, you know, outlined in text, you know, so like instead of having to like happy right here, let's say I wanted to actually have typed in the word happy. So let's click on T for text tool. I'm going to type in happy. And let's say I wanted like um, that cloud effect coming through it. So I'm going to move happy down over these clouds. There we go. So I can create something called a clipping mask. So I'm going to make sure both of these are selected. Hopefully my layer order is correct. So that's the part I always forget. So I'm going to click on happy. I'm going to hold down the shift key and click on the background image. They're both active. And I'm going to come up to object and I am going to go to, where are you? I never remember where you are. Clipping mask, make. Ah, I had it right. So you can see that the image disappears and happy is right here. Now to make this still work, I'm going to need to select this and come up to object and I'm going to need to rasterize it again. Otherwise it, it won't, um, it won't work. Looks like we had a quick chat question. I've got basic experience with these programs and this presentation is great. I'm curious if these guidelines and tips are available somewhere for reference. They are available in the form of this, um, excuse me, 
they are available in the form of this uh, lecture. So this lecture is recorded and will be posted to um, will be posted to my brain turns on YouTube and uh, do spaces uh, <laughs> Facebook. If you give me a second, I will also bring up that PowerPoint and I'll put it up as a Dropbox link so you guys can download it as well if you would like. So Dropbox and I will get you guys a uh, link to this bad boy. Are there any other questions in these kind of last minutes of wrapping up? Otherwise, I think once I post this link, we'll go ahead and call it um, a day. See workshops and mentoring, laser cutter, pew pew. Share, please. And I would like a link. Copy link. And I will go ahead and put this in chat for your guys' convenience. And here is a link to the files that we looked at today. You're welcome to refer to them um, today when we are working, when you work through this on your own, including that uh, all those settings that were in um, the program. If you are a complete novice, what is a good way to start? Um, I would play around in Illustrator and kind of make up some shapes that kind of explore the four key concepts we talked about, laser cut, laser score, laser etch, and laser engrave. There's also some really good Instructables out there. So if you go to Instructable, if you Google that, they'll bring up these different individual projects. I think one of the best projects to start with um, is to make a, a coin or to make one of these boxes, because then you have an object that's fairly simple to make and can be fun and fun to have when you're done. So like, I really like making these boxes um, just because they're, you can make something useful that way. Um, all right, well, if we don't have any more questions, I hope this has been all useful for, been very useful for you guys. And um, once Do Space opens up normally again after COVID, um, you can schedule mentor meetings with me or anyone else who is um, uh, proficient with the laser cutter, and we can walk you through that last little bit of step to actually use the machine. Because again, today's focus was prepping the files because the machines are a little bit different and we can't do it by a webcam. All right. Good night, everyone. I hope this has been fun.